והיום כולם ישירו כל תפילה ושיר הלל, והמלאכים ינימו, זה היום עשה השם. אוקיי, אז עכשיו אני יכולה להגיד פרופרלי, שלום לכולם, תודה רבה שאתם מבינים אותי היום, אני באמת מאוד 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 <laughs> and thank you so much for joining too and what we are going to do is that we are going to study the book of Jonah or Jonah today and I think that those who are on zoom you can type it like type a message in the chat if you have a question and in the end in the end when we'll have time to look at the question then we can turn to it so if you have anything that you really want to know Daniel is here to help us and facilitate this study session, so you can drop your question there. Okay, so we are going to use this uh, Moxor just because it has Book of Jonah in it, but for those who are online, again, you can use any book that you have which has Book of Jonah. It's, it really doesn't, really doesn't matter. It's on page... 367. And the reason why it's in the small zone, obviously, because Book of John is read on Yom Kippur. So this is our main question today of why actually this book is read on Yom Kippur. And maybe some of you already have some answers, maybe not. Maybe we'll come up with a new answer today. Before we actually start, can I ask you to go like around and say all of your names? And we begin with you. My name is Rose, and I've been here for quite a while. Nice to meet you, Rose. And we're all... Isaac Silverstein. <gasps> That's you and my family, I remember. That's right. Isaac <laughs> Silverstein. Yeah. And Bell. And Bell. Huh. Well, still related, I feel. And all of you who are online, I I can see your names. That's <laughs> if it's not your name, then oh sorry. I know I know most of you the names, so it's not because I forgot your name, it's for those whose names I don't remember. And I'm Rabbi Zilberstein, as we already established. So There are a lot of questions about Book of Jonah. It's a very interesting and confusing book. I can say it all consists of questions. And I'm sure that you know more or less, like I'm sure that you're familiar with the story. It's a very fairly short book. I think most of people know the main story. It's like pretty simple, but it's also very complicated. So let's like really quickly just review the main, main plot, what's happening. The first what happened, Jonah received the commandment from God to go to Nineveh and to deliver a prophecy. Do you remember that? Okay, then what happens? He doesn't want to go. He wants to run away to another place that is called Tarshish. Nobody knows where that is actually, but he tries to run away and he flies to, he flees to um, Yafo and then he tries to sail with, you know, in a ship somewhere. And then God brings a huge storm and the ship is nearly sunk. And then what happens? The sailors, they come to Jonah and we're going to read the entire book after that. I'm just like reviewing the whole, you know, just to remind you what's, what's happening there. So sailors come to Jonah and they say, what have you done? Why is this happening? And he's saying, oh, that's because of me. Uh, drop me into sea. And they say, okay, we don't want to do that, but like, we don't have any other choice. Let's do that. And they cast him into the sea. The big fish swallows him. He prays in the belly of the fish. And after a few days, fish spits him out and he goes to Nineveh, right? What happens in Nineveh? The whole city repents. They, they actually accept his message and they say, 
all woe on us and they all repent and they all fast and they you know repent on their sins and god changes actually god's mind in this moment and says okay i forgive ninbe what happens to jonah he got really upset and angry he said i told you so why did you do this to me and then there is a final dialogue between god and, and jonah and this is the end of the book so this is the, this is it the book is really short it has only four chapters it's kind of very popular and adopted for actually for children's books because it compared to other books it doesn't have really anything super cruel or like super problematic like for example in the book of esther you know we have this idea that jews killed like a genocide killed thousands of people you know for children that's not so appealing and book of Ruth, for example, you know, there is this romantic relationship between Ruth and Boaz, what they did, they do, you know, in the field, all of that. Um, what else, what, what other books do we have? Like books of uh, like Echa, Lamentations, or Job, they're just very complicated, sad, and, you know, but book of Jonah doesn't have any of those problems. That's why it's so good for children. Nothing, nothing really, you know, that scary happens in it. And, you know, there's also this fun fish element. So, this is the question, why such a book, which is, you know, bit, uh, you know, sometimes a little bit ridiculous and a little bit whimsical and a little bit childish. Why is it a book of Yom Kippur, which is like the hardest day in our whole year of celebrations, the most serious day? So that is the question that I'm trying to answer myself. And this is what we are going to try to, you know, answer together. Um, Another thing that kind of brings it close to the book of Esther, there is a whole theory about it, that this kind of books, they might have been meant to be staged because they remind like a play. They, 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 the structure of the book is a little bit like a play because it has very clear scenes. It has like, you know, the kind of an introduction to the story that you see like you have a scene at the sea, you have a scene with the fish, you have a scene with, you know, with the was done in the Ninve and like it's very visual it's very easy to imagine it's not confusing in it's like order like it's not complicated so it, it would be a good actually book to stage so it's the same thing about the book of Esther is that and that's why it's actually in Purim it's so often is a performance because it also has this quality that it's very easy to understand how how yeah how it actually meant to be as a play and there is um we don't really know when the book was written when the book of jonah was written and there are all kinds of different you know theories about it and the jonah himself like a prophet we don't know really who he is we only know his name that he is jonah son of amitai but we don't know anything else about him there is another jonah or maybe the same jonah that is like mentioned once in, in the second book of kings and like chapter 14 just mentioned once that's it but like he's not mentioned anywhere else so we don't really know anything about him we didn't we don't know where he lived we don't know where like he came from we don't know what he has to do in common with Ninve and why he sat there we don't know uh where he's going because we don't know really Tarshish what that is probably it just means like the end of the world you know somewhere far far away we also we kind of know where Ninve is now and it's a city that actually used to be the biggest city in the world at some point of history. It used to be. It is a really big city for the standards of like any ancient world. And it was rediscovered. And in 20th century, it was even rebuilt to some extent, you know, some historical sites until in, if I'm not mistaken, in 2015, ISIS actually came and blew it, blew it up again. So it's a city that has this very kind of tragic history of you know, being this magical, like this huge city where, you know, the prophecy is happening and but then falling and being rebuilt and falling again. So we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Maybe it's not over yet. But what I'm wanting to say is that there is a theory, actually, that the book of Jonah was written fairly late in the Hellenistic period. And that's why it has this qualities of a play. And that's why it's so kind of closer to our liter literature of today compared to some other books that are very, very complicated. So 
Um, as I said, we don't know much about the character or about like, is there any historical relevance to the events that are described there? We don't really know that. It's said that Ninveh is a city like that it took three days to cross the city. There are no such big cities even today in the world. So probably that's an exaggeration. No, it, and all kinds of things like that. And especially the fact that uh, actually God forgave the people of Ninveh. That is probably meant to be like a satire of a sort. The combination of like funny side of the story and the heavy fight signs of the story. Of course, the sense of humor of people of that time was a little bit different from us. So for us, maybe it doesn't sound so funny, but when we are going to read it, I'll try to show where it was supposed to be funny at least. Okay, so we are going, as I said, we're just going to read through the most of it, this book together. And there are four chapters and chapter one is on page, as I said, 367. Do you have any questions at this moment so far? We were good. We know what we are doing here. Okay. <laughs> the word of Adonai came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go at once to Ninveh, the great city, and proclaim judgment upon it, for their wickedness has come before me. This is the opening, the first thing that God says to Jonah. Go to the city of Ninveh. And I'm going to kind of point out the some you know some words that are lost in translation because translation is as they say always a lie and every translation loses something so here it says go at once to Ninveh in original it actually says kum lech it means like rise up and go so it has this like hey Jonah rise up and go and he says uh, no I don't want to go and this is the verse Three, Jonah, however, started out to flee to Tarshish from Adonai's service. He went down to, it says Joppa, but it's, I don't know why they say it here, but it's like Yafo, and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went aboard to sail with the others to Tarshish, away from the service of Adonai. So what's important about language here is that God says to Jonah, go up, rise up, and go to Nineveh, and Jonah instead, he goes down. He'll constantly go down. He goes down to Yafo. He goes down to the ship. He is like, there is a absolutely very prominent directions of going. And Jonah will constantly go down, 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 down. And this will be his direction. So this is like the first kind of a question that is the, you know, the most complicated question probably of the book that how does Jonah imagine running away from God? If God is omnipresent and ruler of the universe, how can you run away from God? Do you have any ideas? Fear of God. Fear of God. If you run to Tarshish, you will be at least less fearless there. Will it be less scary in Tarshish than in where he was if there was a fear? Are the as far as yeah, well, yes, there is an attempt. The interesting thing is that the, the text itself, it doesn't really kind of underline it as a problem, it doesn't say that this was a ridiculous idea. And actually later, when Jonah is going to talk to sailors and tell them that, you know, I tried to run away, they will also not tell him like, oh, you're stupid or what? Like, why are you trying? Like for them, it was an idea that actually made some kind of a sense that it's ridiculous. So perhaps it's just for us to interpret. It's a question. There will be a lot of questions that are not actually answered that are posed in the text, but they don't have a final answer. Yes. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, it shows you that Jonah was naive at the beginning. He wasn't fully a believer in God. I mean, that it took time and courage for him to establish his faith, and, to, and eventually, I guess, in the belly of the whale, his faith was in God and was established. Where then he was willing to speak to the people. So it's a transformation of Jonah. You see how 
he develops as a as a true believer in in Adonai. That's not my faith. Good. That's a good faith. I uh, I agree that there is a transformation. I don't know if he was a believer in God or not, because I think that a desire to run away from God, it should come from a deep belief in God. Because if you don't believe in God, why would you try to run away? And that is the, I think that that's what makes this book so powerful, that within this kind of weird situations and weird questions, there are very deep emotions hidden and it's meant this way to awake these emotions in us and and when we are in Yom Kippur and remember that this is read as a haftorah in the evening service so this is like the end of Yom Kippur when people are completely tired and hungry and thirsty and all of that and this is the time when this book is read so it's designed to kind of make you think about this like what would you do if you were Yona did you ever try to run away from God did you ever feel that the task that is upon you is too heavy for you? Did you want ever, you know, secretly thinking that maybe someone else will come and deal with this mess and not you? Did it ever feel that the constant watch of the guardian of Israel is, you know, who never sleeps or slumber is like too, too much? Too much for you? Did you ever feel like that? So this is these are the questions. Yes. I mean, maybe I'm, what I was saying was that maybe he did have belief in God, but that he felt that initially that God couldn't actually reach him on the boat or in in Tarshish. That his his he didn't really have the full sense of of the power and awe. Of, of the Almighty at different times. Okay, we're that's a good idea. We're not going to discuss every idea. You, you shared your idea. We I understand it and we heard it. We don't, you know, it's a good idea. I'm not saying that you know my idea is right and yours is wrong. It's this is the meaning of the book that you think about it. That you that you constantly think about all these questions. Like, what would you do? What does it mean? Can you run away? Can you not run away? What is your transformation? Are you a true believer in God or not? And will you be transformed by the end of Yom Kippur or you come to Yom Kippur in the beginning and leave it exactly the same person? These are the questions. So um, Jonah flees to Tarshish. As I said, seems not to be a real place, but probably a symbolic representation of something very far away. And as I said, he went down and in the in the story of the boat, he is going to go deeper and deeper and deeper in the boat itself. It's not enough that he went down to Tarshish or to the boat. In the boat, he is going to go deeper. Um, so let's look at the verse, chapter one, verse four. But Adonai cast a mighty wind upon the sea and such a great tempest came upon the sea that the ship was in danger of breaking up. In their fear, the sailors cried out, each to his own God, and they flung the ship's cargo overboard to make it lighter for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of vessel where he lay down and fell asleep. You see how, how deep he is going. Like there is nowhere deeper than that. He is in the depths of a ship. And then what he does, he falls asleep. Why is that happening? Yes. That is an escape. Absolutely. And that is an escape, actually. Um, of course, people at that time didn't know much about depression the way that we know it. The, the, one of the major symptoms of depression is that people fall asleep in an appropriate time entirely because the pain of their existence is so heavy on them that they want to turn off the, their, you know, brains and just fall asleep. So this is what he's doing. He's in, probably in a very big distress and he wants to escape it and he doesn't want to deal with it and he falls asleep. But you need to be, you know, you need to be in a very special mental state in order to fall asleep during the storm on a ship. You can imagine the ship goes like this, like it's up and down. Like it's very hard to sleep. You need to be like in very, very, some kind of a, 
strange mental condition to do that. That's why assumption that he might have been depressed. And that's why he tried to run away. And that's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh and he wanted to escape to the sea. And then this idea that he's running away from God, it gets a little bit more of a depth in it and a little bit another dimension. Because this um, downward motion, like this, his, his direction downwards, it, it also shows his, again, this emotional state, this emotional state, he's feeling worse, he's feeling heavier, heavier, and heavier. And it actually said in the Talmud, and it's a very famous quote, and probably many of you heard of it, that dream, sleeping is one sixtieth of death. Have you heard of that? Fire is one sixtieth of Gehenna, or fire is one sixtieth, one sixtieth of um, hell. Honey is one sixtieth of mana. Shabbat is one sixtieth of the world to come. Sleep is one sixtieth of death. And a dream is one sixtieth of prophecy. Have you heard about that? Yep. So this is in Talmud Babli. So, so if sleep is one sixtieth of death, you see what he's doing. He's He's, he's close to that. He, he, he is getting to a state of mind where he doesn't really want to leave anymore. That is how, how bad he feels. And let's see what happens next. That is verse six. The captain went over to him and cried out, how can you be sleeping so soundly? Up, call upon your God. Perhaps the God will be kind to us and will not, we will not perish. So he's trying to wake him up. He's trying to do something. He is, again, he's telling him to like, up, up, rise up. And he, he doesn't want to do it. And the crew said to one another, let us cast lots and find out on whose account this misfortune, misfortune has come upon us. And then they cast a lot and they find that this is Jonah. And they come to him and they say, like, who are you? And he's saying, I'm Hebrew. I worship Adonai, the God of heaven, who made both sea and land meaning that he is aware that God is actually the ruler of the sea. So it's not when he is attempting to run away, he knows that he cannot hide in the sea. He knows that God is the ruler of everything. So he's not, you know, he's not stupid. He knows what he's doing. Um, and they ask, what must we do to make the sea calm around us? Where the sea was growing more and more stormy. I'm on page 368. And he says, have me overboard and the sea will come down for you. For I know that this terrible storm came upon you on my account. Nevertheless, they try not to do it, but in the end, they'll have to do it anyway. And they heaved John overboard and the sea stopped raging. So what are we seeing in his, in his uh, you know, request he's saying pick me up and cast me down so from his uh, bottom of the ship where he was he goes even deeper than that and this this kind of a uh, request it is a uh, really like if you if it's a storm and you ask someone to cast you in the sea you're probably not going to survive this so this is for real now his attempt to suicide for suicide and if you think that this is like too modern and you know authors of that didn't know about anything about the depression or suicides or anything like that actually in one of the midrashim and it's a mechilta collection it's third century ce fairly old rabbi Nathan said jonah simply wanted to lose himself in the sea for it is sad, pick me up and cast me into the sea. So already in Mishkilta, they had an idea that he didn't try to run away from God physically. He wanted to be lost in the sea. He wanted to die in the sea. And that's why he went, went there. He didn't want just to run to Tarshish. That was his, his gun. He doesn't want to deal with this. He, he's going deeper and deeper and deeper. This is the end of the first scene. This is... He's being, he's drowning in the, in the sea. Chapter two. Chapter two, page 369. Next scene, Adonai provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah remained in the fish, fish's belly three 
days and three nights. And Jonah prayed to his God Adonai from the belly of the fish. And this is a very beautiful poem. And this poem, it's in order to appreciate it again, like with many other books in the Torah, you kind of need to know the rest of the Torah because this, this prayer, it has connections to other prayers, for example, to Psalms and to other, other portions of the Torah. And the one that in the Psalm, like if we look at the beginning, in my trouble, I called to Adonai from the belly of Sheol, I cried out, he cast me into the depths, the floods engulfed me, all your breakers and billows. I saw that I was driven away when I ever gazed again upon your holy table, temple. So what it reminds of is actually the Psalms. And in the Psalms, you probably heard that also Min HaMetzar, from the depths I called on to you. So this is parallel to that, to, to that text. And again, so the, the author of this text aware of that or the vice versa, we don't know really, but the assumption that if it's later book that they know about the Psalms and that's why they quote the Psalms here. Who wants to read the whole, the whole uh, poem to us? I invite some of you, one of you to read it. Barbara, do you want to read? With my trouble, I called to Adonai, who answered me. From the belly of Sheol, I saw an earth, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the depths, into the heart of the sea, and the flood engulfed me. All the breakers of the billows swept over me. I thought I was driven away out of your sight. Will I ever gaze again upon the holy temple? The waters closed in over me, the deep engulfed me. Leaves twined me round my head. I turned to the base of the mountain. The bars of the earth closed upon me forever. Yet you brought my life up from the pit, O oh my God, ever mind. When my life was ebbing away, I called ever my to mind. And my prayer came before you, into your holy temple. They who came to empty folly to save their own welfare. But I, with loud thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. When I have vowed, I will perform deliverance is ever mine. Thank you so much. Do you think it's beautiful? I think it is. And especially for me, this image of the seaweed like on your head, it was always very powerful because this is when you feel very down and, and, and sad and you feel like entangled in your problems. This is how it feels and it's like wet seaweeds everywhere. So I think it's very powerful. But what's interesting about it that if you notice, first of all, it's in past tense. Like he is praying from the belly of the fish as if he was saved already. And also, it, like, he doesn't do any, you know, repentance or anything like that. Like, the theme of Yom, Yom Kippur is repentance, right? So, this is not a repentance prayer. This is a prayer about the kindness of God and, you know, loving kindness and, and, and care and all of this thing. So, it's an interesting prayer. It's very, it's a poem in the middle of the book. But it's, again, it's a little bit weird. There's something weird about it, the way that it's made in the, you know, written in the past tense. So we will come back to it and try to understand why it's in the past tense. But what happens after that? Adonai commanded to fish and it spewed Jonah out, up, out upon dry land. That was the end of the chapter two. The scene is over. The scene with the fish. We have the uh, going down, 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 down in the sheep, down in the sea, down in the belly of the fish. And there are also Midrashim that are telling that in this, while he was in the belly, the fish went down like to the deepest part of the ocean. And he saw like the, you know, the, the like cornerstone of the entire earth and he like saw all the mysteries of the depths of the sea so even there like it goes as deep as possible so here is the end of the scene we're done with the sea and the fish and the world of Adonai came this is chapter three came to Jonah second time go at once at Nineveh the great city and proclaim to eat what I tell you and Jonah went at once to Nineveh in accordance with Adonai's command 
great. Finally, he goes where God told him to go. Nineveh was an enormously large city, a three days walk across. I would like to notice here that, again, in this translation, it's not really said here that in the original, it actually said that this is the uh, city of God. It says Nineveh was a large city of God, if we look uh, in the original mm -hmm. in Hebrew. So that's the question. So this is this is actually very interesting that Nineveh is definitely not in Israel. You know, Nineveh today is a modern Iraq. It's like near Mosul. That's why ISIS actually attacked it. So it's very far away. It's not the land of Israel. So what does it tell us again? That God is the ruler of all the lands, not only the land of Israel, right? That God is the ruler of all of nations and that God cares about all of nations and all of cities. And such a great city, which was the biggest city in the world at that time. And this is a historical fact that it was once a time, once upon a time, a city, the biggest city. It means that it belongs to God. It's God's. God's city and the prophets note that the prophets are not only sent to warn you know Israelites or Jews prophets are sent to other nations as well and the whole story is actually not happening for Jews we assume that that Jonah actually was a Jew himself although there are Midrashim that says that his mother wasn't Jewish there are all kinds of stories about him it's very uh, very interesting figure um Others say other stories said that no, he was you know descendant of uh, priests and he was coin. Or he he is a controversial figure, but notice that this story is not about Jews. It's not about the Jewish city. It's not saying the Jews. It's a potentially a Jew going to other people and warn them. And what these people do when they hear the 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 the, the, the prophecy. On page 370, the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and great and small alike put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his robe, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he had the word cried through Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, no human or beast or flock or herd shall taste anything. They shall not graze and they shall not drink water. They shall be covered with sackcloth, humans and beasts, and shall cry mightily to God. Let everyone turn back from their evil ways and from the injustice of which they are guilty. Who knows, but that God may turn and relent. God may turn back from wrath so that we do not perish. So this is a perfect example for what we should do on Yom Kippur, right? We fast, we atone for our sins, we do all of the, what people did here, but notice that these people are not Jews. So how humbling it should be for us. Again, one of the themes of Yom Kippur, that we, we, I don't know if you think ever like that, but many Jews do think that, you know, we're special, we're we're chosen people, we're God's beloved people, all of that. So this is a humbling reminder that this is what actual people of Nineveh did and God forgave them and we follow their example. I think it's very humbling at least. And God saw what they did, how they were turning back from the, their evil ways and God renounced the punishment that had been planned for them and did not carry it out. Great, this is perfect, right? Everything worked out just fine. So if we look, this is the end of chapter three. The scene is closing. This is the end of the scene. So we have these three chapters. We have Jonah who didn't want to fulfill, you know, he didn't want to pursue his destiny. He wanted to run away. He tried to run away. He got through this transformation um, in the belly of the fish. And then after that, he goes to Nineveh, he, he proclaims, you know, the prophecy and they listen to it and then, then they repent and God forgives them. End of the story. That would be a happy end, right? That would be great if this was the end of the story. Isn't it, doesn't it feel like the logical end of the whole thing? It teaches us about the power of repentance. So why, why not to end here?
but instead we have a chapter four. And what's in the chapter four? As I said uh, before, in this prayer from the belly of the fish, Jonah does not repent. He actually does not he does not experience this, this catharsis. He doesn't experience this uh, repentance, you know, emotion the way that Ninveh people did. He doesn't do that. He kind of just say, you know, God saved me and that's it. And he says it's in the past tense because there is this idea that if we talk about God in past tense, like he already did that, it means that he's going to do it in the future. That's like, that's very typical for our prayers and that's used multiple times. And that has like a little bit of magical thinking, you know, like in modern, I don't know, trainings for positive thinking and success, they're saying like, you shouldn't think that you're going to be rich one day. Think that you're rich already and this will help you. So this is this kind of a thinking, but like he doesn't do any inner work or examination of his soul or anything. Like this doesn't happen. So chapter four is the continuation of his inner conflict and his struggle. This is not the end of the story. These displeased Jonah. This is chapter four, verse one, page 370. These displeased, displeased Jonah greatly, and he was grieved. He prayed to Adonai saying, Oh Adonai, isn't this just what I said when I was still in my own country? That is why I fled beforehand to Tarshish, for I know that you are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, renouncing punishment. Please, Adonai, take my life, for I would rather die than live. What is this? What is this prayer? You also might um, recognize this, these words. I know that you are compassionate and gracious, God, slow in anger, abounding, abounding in kindness. This is like the, the, the core of the prayer that we recite. You know, Adonai, Adonai, Rakum Bechanun, this one, Erech Hapayim, Baraf Chesed, you remember, Adonai, Adonai. But this is one, like this is another connection of this book to Yom Kippur. This is the key line. But like when we recite it, we actually ask God for forgiveness and for granting us life. We ask God to be written in the book of life. We ask God to, you know, in Rosh Hashanah to have a, one more year at least. We're asking for life. Here he's using this the same line, but he's asking for what? He is asking for death. So he's none of his, none of his troubles, his inner conflicts, his, his struggling, his, his pain was resolved. And he's again asking for to take his life and he's saying you're you're kind and gracious god take my life how deeply distressed the person should be to have this kind of a mindset like what should a person feel so this is how how deep his pain is and adonai replied are you that deeply grieved it's a question right is there an answer to it? Next line. Now Jonah had left the city and found a place east of the city and so on and so forth. So there's a question God is asking him. First of all, notice that God is talking to him all the time. Again, this is a privilege not many of us can you know, uh, enjoy. God is talking to him all the time. And God is asking, are you that deeply grieved? And there is no answer. Why? Why there is no What's the what, what's going on? Not sorry. Not sorry. I think he's asking a legitimate human question. If you do things wrong, do things wrong, you should be punished. And now he's asking God all these wrong things that are being done. And you're not punishing them. Why? Isn't that the question? So you think that the Jonah is really upset because Ninveh survived? Yeah. So he's really upset that that God wanted to kill all of these people and then he changed his mind and that. Yeah. But then human 
of life at that time who committed a crime who could be in jail. Here the people are committing crime and God saves them. And he says, what's going on to you? Well, well, do you know what crimes did they do? I think it's a lot of people. They were crimes. So that is the purpose of Yom Kippur. And we all commit a crime, we go to jail. And here the people are committing crimes and God forgives them. And he says, I don't understand what's going on here. You're very gracious, basically, but great. Did you want to say something? Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, actually it just came up in Dr. Davis' talks today that they get the issue around uh, repentance, but they get be really, they, you, you can do something wrong, but if you really don't say to yourself, am I right, Gloria, that if you, you say to yourself, I'm not going to do this again, or that I made a mistake and I internalized that. Issue, and then I, I promise myself I'm not going to do that again. That's true repentance. But if you say, Oh, I did something wrong, and you know, we sort of walk off it without really taking what you did wrong seriously and thinking about it, then that, that's not really, that's, that's not really improving yourself. Let's put it that way. Yeah, well, so, but I see, I think we live in this world right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like, there are, I've been feeling your things out there. I think what are the young, what we, I mean, I'm not going to mention this specific, where people do something and they are absolutely not in any way held responsible for what they do. But the people of Nineveh, they seem to take the responsibility. And again, like if he was so worried about the people of Nineveh, why he wants to die? Like, God, you, you saved all these people, now kill me. That's, for me, that means that he's thinking about himself. He doesn't really care about the people of Nineveh or God's justice. Because he, like, what should happen to you that you are so upset with God saving people that you want to die? So he has these deep, deep problems with God or with his life, with everything that's happening in his life. So my, again my interpretation of it, my understanding of it is that he is going through this kind of a existential crisis. Again, did it ever happen to you that you were in very kind of a low point in your life and you everything was very complicated and then suddenly you felt like you found a new meaning and you get energized and you get excited and then you 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 go and you I don't know want to try something new and you want to go on an adventure that's what happening to him he was very depressed he was in the sea he wanted to die then he believed God and he is on this mission to be a prophet to go to the city he goes there he believes in God he delivers the message and that God make makes a joke out of him right he said like yeah no I I changed my mind I'm not going not going to happen so all of his excitement about it his hopes were so high you know that he now he has a meaning in life after all of that that again the whole story turns ridiculous and meaningless and nothing happens and he looks like a fool imagine that you are a prophet who comes to the city and you say this city is going to be it said uprooted in 40 days and then it doesn't happen what kind of prophet you are so that was that was makes him sad. Not not the fact that people will say that, that his own position and the fact that he he wanted to be this hero, you know, of the story. And again, it all got meaningless. So he goes back into his uh, you know depression again. So he's from this high point goes down again. And when God asks him, "Are you that deeply grieved?" He doesn't answer because he, what he doesn't do, he doesn't do, a, you know, self-examination and inner dialogue. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't talk to God. He doesn't respond. So again, it's a, all of these questions that don't have answers. I think they're intended for you, the reader, to ask yourself. When something happens to you, are you really that deeply grieved? Is it really that serious? And in many cases, I guess we can come to understand it, that maybe the problem is not so big. But in many cases, we come to the understanding that it is very big.
but you need to ask yourself honestly, honestly in your heart, are you that deeply grieved? Is it that serious? When you are in Yom Kippur service, which is intended to be sad, are you there just like flicking through pages and you know reading prayers and your mind is somewhere else? Or are you that deeply grieved? Do you experience that? So this is, this is a question that brings you back, reminds you what you actually should do. You should be in the dialogue with yourself, examining your own soul and your own troubles and your own feelings and talking to God because God is talking to you on Yom Kippur. The doors are open. This is like the best day for connection to God, you know? If it's like a, a internet, you know, we have a dial up internet and we have like high speed internet. This is like, you know, fiber optics. I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is a satellite kind of a connection, the best connection we can imagine. So are you that deeply grieved? Doesn't say anything. Verse five, now Jonah had left the city and found a place east of the city. While he goes there, he wants to see what's going to happen to the city. He made a boost there and sat under it in the shade until he should see what happened to the city. He's a little bit, I would say, like a little bit like a teenager, you know. He goes to his room, like he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to talk, he doesn't want to deal with it. He just goes there and he's, I imagine him always sitting like this. He sits there and he's watching what's going to happen to the city. What's going to happen to the city? God already said that nothing is going to happen to the city, but he's still sitting there and waiting. And he's looking at the city, not, not inside him. He's still looking there and hoping that maybe God will destroy the city and he'll not look so stupid like a false prophet. And God, Adonai, provided a, I don't know what is this plant, Resinous plant, nobody knows what that plant is, some kind of a plant which grew up over Jonah to provide shade for his head and save him from discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But the next day at dawn, God provided a worm which attacked the plant so that it was withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a sultry east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head and he became faint and he begged for death saying, I would rather die than live. What is he asking about again? Still wants to die. He's asking about death. If, of all the books in the Torah, he's the, the character who is asking for death like persistently more than anyone else. There are other cases when, when our characters actually ask for death. There is a case when Moshe is saying, you know, better kill me. I don't want to deal with Israelites anymore. I'm tired of them. I'd rather die. There are other, the other cases. Job is definitely talking about, you know, it would be better for me to die. But he is like, I want to die. I want to die. He's like very straightforward with this. Please kill me. I don't want to live anymore. Then God said to Jonah, are you so deeply grieved about the plant? The question comes again, asking again, are you so deeply grieved? And what are you grieved about? Is it about the plant? Do you really care about the plant? That's, sorry, the plant that much? But probably not. Probably not the plant is the problem, I would, I would guess. He says, yes, so deeply that I want to die. This is how sad he is. Is he again, is he sad about the plant? Or is it something else that he is sad about? I like plants too. If mm -hmm. if plant dies, I, I I feel very sad about it. Especially if it's a miraculous plant like this and probably very beautiful and gave him shade and he got attached to it. And then it it dies. That the 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 plant dies. What is he upset about? That he has no control of anything. He has no control of life and death. Only God has control of life and death. He can't. His life, he wants to run away, he can't. He wants to deliver a prophecy, he can't. You know, he, he has this plan that dies. Everything that happens to him, he's, you know, he's not in control of his life. And that's uh, one of the, again, deepest reasons for modern, you know, psychoanalysis of depression is that people, they don't have a control over their lives. They don't know how to live anymore. Their problems are too complicated for them to resolve. 
and they have no meaning in life. So this is what he's going through. And then Adonai said, you cared about the plan which you did not work for and which you did not grow, which appeared overnight and perished overnight. And should not I care about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who did not yet know their right hand from their left and many beasts as well. And this is the end of the book. This is literally the end. This is how it ends. This is uh, in, in, in Mazur, if you can see, there is also an addition of Mecha, like there is a little piece added in the end. My theory that it's added precisely for this reason, that this ending is not, it's an open ending. It's just a question. God is saying, well, you care about the plan, shouldn't I care about Nineveh? And that's a question without with no answer again. So this is a question again to us to try to answer this question for ourselves. And I think again that if it was planned, like you know, type of a play or piece of literature that is like a good movie, you know, good movie that you watch and then you go back home and you're still thinking about it and then next three days you are still thinking about it if the movie was ended like this it, it give you a question to think so this is what happens here it's it's like this is the end of the story god says well should you know why wouldn't they care about him then so what happens to john after that he doesn't die, <laughs> he doesn't die. <laughs> that's for sure and i can tell you more in midrashim they're actually midrashim that he never died mm -hmm. yeah that he was uh some kind of like a, it says that like a spirit of god came upon him and he never died so that dream of his never was fulfilled he wanted to die many times did not happen well that's again a question like is it comfortable for you to think that you have no control i guess he took away he planted the tree then he took away the tree and that was protection for him that's a good question i think i think it teaches us that none of our problems are ever resolved until we actually die like all of the things that happen to us even it's a big you know kind of a Maybe it's a big tragedy, or maybe it's a, just a, some kind of a big problem. It's not kind of the end of the story. It's going to happen again, that the, the plants will rise and they will fall. As it here, it says that it's overnight. It said that the, God says that this plant appeared overnight and perished overnight. So this is a reminder of the, you know, how life is short, our life is short in the scale of the universe it's like even less than overnight so this is this is a very actually heavy book if you think about it it's a very heavy book there's very heavy questions and very heavy existential questions of like the meaning of our life who has control of our life all these kind of things are they going to happen to us and we cannot do anything with this and we just have to hope that maybe there will be a miraculous plan for us to have a shade but then tomorrow it's gone so it's a book that is intended for a very deep self-reflection and asking yourself all these very complicated questions. So we have five minutes left. Um, are there any important questions in the chat that I need to answer? I have, I have thought, though. OK, There's, sure. <laughs> uh, I, I, I like that uh, maybe it's a reminder that Jonah is only thinking about things that affect him. It's very, he's kind of egotistical because, you know, it's like, I'm not going to do this and I don't want to be wrong. So I'd rather the whole city perish than, than me be wrong. And I'm going to soak and I'm going to just check to see if it's going to happen anyways. And, and, you know, 
I only cared about the plant because it provided me with shade, but now that it's not providing me with shade, I'm sad again. And maybe it, he has a very narrow focus, and it's kind of maybe a reminder on the before even to look outside of yourself and look at the community, look at the greater world, and and not just think about the self. So that's great kind of point. Great point. I think it has many more messages. I think that what it makes so beautiful and so powerful is that it is a tragic comedy. It has this qualities of like, you know, I'm gonna sit like and see what's going to happen. And like when he is talking to God and it's like, are you really that deeply upset? And he's like, yes, I'm so sad. I want to die, you know, like all of that. It's exaggerated. That's like a satire. And also the people of Nineveh who are saying, okay, we all repent, all repent, even animals repent, and they will not feed them. Like, you're not, not going to, you know, starve your dog on Yom Kippur, I hope. I hope so. But that's what they do. So there's a lot of exaggeration like that. Um, but then it asks all this, like, really scary questions, really, about what's going to happen to us. Are we going to live for the next year or not? How are we going to live next year? And are there any kind of uh, consequences of our actions? Are we in control of what's happening in our life? Or is it just like completely what God wants and we cannot do anything about it? All of those questions. And there are more and more and more questions like that. And I hope that next time when you read this book, there will be questions that I didn't come up with because... I also read through my lens and through my life experience, and I don't have like your life experience. So I hope you'll find your personal questions because there are so many questions that are unanswered and directed to all of us. So this is the end of this session. Thank you so much for coming. If you have a question right now, you can ask. But other than that, uh, if you want to go, you can go. <laughs> I respect sleep time. And I really very much appreciate that you came. Really, it means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. I hope. I hope. <laughs> it's all the author of the book, not not me. It's an interesting book. Something that occurs to me is why did God choose Jonah to do that song? Jonah, everybody. No, the jhana means dove. Dove? Yes, yeah. the bird. Yeah, and it might be a connection to the actually Bereshit, the flood, yes. As a yona is a bird who is like sent, who is sent away and he comes back with the, you know, positive news that the land is getting dry again. So it might be a connection to that, that he is this kind of a bird that like flies tries to fly away and can fly away and the messenger of God, essentially. And again, it's a question of like, do, do animals have free will? All these animals, cattle here, did they really need to repent? Does a bird have a free will? Does Yona have a free will? Or he just obeys that? All of those questions are a lot of, a lot of things to think about. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>